The, uh, the first question, well, we are absolutely delighted to have you. Uh, we uh, have visited with you in London yeah. a couple years in a row now, yeah. and it's absolutely the highlight of our experience. Uh, many of the students that have had a chance to visit with you oh, in your office, as well as I in did. Parliament, yep. are here today. And uh, it's always one of the most memorable experiences. So we're excited to be able to share your wisdom and experience with a greater swath of our students here mm. at Utah State. So thank you for being here. The first question is uh, one from home. Oh. It comes from my, my seven-year-old who was, yeah. when I told him someone was coming from the United Kingdom. Oh, dear. He, he wanted to know what language they speak there. <laughs> Welsh. Welsh. Okay. <laughs> Right. If you could, uh, give us a little sense of, of your responsibilities and the scope of your influence. If you could tell us a little bit about where you've been, the work you've been doing in recent weeks, mm. just give us a little idea mm. of, uh, of what your, your recent weeks have looked like. So my son Kenny is here. He's 26. Some of you have uh, met Kenny before when you've been with us in London. We, we've just, well, we got up at 3 o'clock this morning, just so you can feel sympathy for us. Um, we left the hotel at 4 o'clock, we got a 6 o'clock flight, and we got here uh, to Salt Lake City around 9 o'clock. Um, but we've spent the last few days with about 3,500 students from universities all over the world, from 38 countries, including Brigham Young University from Hawaii, which is one of the reasons why Boyd and I first met many, many, many moons ago, and they were the U.S. university group who presented at the Enactus World Cup. So some of you will know about Enactus, and Enactus enables students to create very vivid, meaningful, purposeful companies. So they have to be profitable enterprises which allow students to take on a world challenge, a community challenge, a nation challenge, uh, link it to the sustainable development goals, these 17 objectives that say, by the year 2030, we should have eradicated extreme poverty and hunger in the world. We should have dealt with sanitation. We should have had decent equality for women. We should have ensured that government is fair, that justice is genuine. And they've got to work on things that actually transform communities. And so the, the US team were in the final four yesterday, but so were the Egyptians in the final four, the Canadians were in the final four, and the Germans. And I wonder who you think won. The Egyptians, so you've, you obviously followed it somewhere on social media. You did that very modern thing of checking out a thing called Twitter or something like that. But yes, the Egyptians won. And, I, it, and it was a really meaningful, significant win because all four teams were quite compelling. So I've always had the opportunity to be a final round judge. You get to see the very, very best of what are 72,000 students worth of effort from 1,700 colleges and universities around the world, and it comes together to a final four. And you see these incredible, energetic companies. Some of them are multi-million dollar enterprises that students have created, and they're really changing communities locally, communities internationally. People's lives are shifted forever because of what students have done. And one of the things I, was, I said to Kenny last night, uh, well, we, I was messaging him when I was doing the judging at the front was, now you can see why I'm so enthusiastic about Enactus, because what you get in Enactus is students making their time visibly useful rather than the other side. And you know, the other side is that you drift through the three years or four years, come out at the end and wonder what to do. And what Enactus does is say, this is what you start to do now when you're 18 and you take it on forever. And I, I also get the privilege to address them all uh, and, uh, and tell them a few thoughts, which is great, uh, and just spend time with them. So that's been the last couple of days. And um, immediately before that, something we've been planning for together, so it will take effect on uh, October the 5th, we're planning our second uh, Soccer, football, let's call it what it is. It's English, it's football, the real thing, where the ball is that shape rather than some shape somebody sat on. You know, it's a. <laughs> so you get this distorted ball in there, I don't know how you do it, but they're proper round ball. And uh, um, so we, we visit with a group of, of uh, prisoners, life prisoners, 
um, men who are in for between 20 and 40 years. And uh, we built up deep relationships with them in a, what's a high-risk prison. Um, so we're doing our second football match on October the 5th. Uh, we've got 22 of our guys coming in to play with 30 of them. Um, and then we're launching a mentoring program in the prison. And each one of our guys will, these are people that are friends and mentees to me and to Kenny, and we will, we, each one of ours will then mentor two men in prison. And because they're in prison for up to 40 years, 20 to 40 years, you just, they just need relationships, they need hope, they need somebody to provide a context of encouragement. And so we've had a lot of energy and effort put into that and because it's coming up quick. So say, so what have I been up to? That's it. Well, that's what I love about you as, as someone that is, has a clear sense of purpose and mission, strong sense of values, and that is of contribution. Can you, and that started younger, right? That started with uh, some formative experiences, the example yeah. that, that, your, that your mother gave to you. Yeah. Talk a little bit about yeah. your youth, if you would, how you identify, how yeah. you develop those values and the influence your mother had on yeah. you. Well, you, I'm sure you know General MacArthur said that youth is a matter of the mind. So my youth is now. <laughs> I know you laugh at that thought because you're looking at me thinking, nope, the gray hair. But I, f I feel probably as young as all of you, if not younger than some of you, just depending on how you approach the opportunities of life. And um, so I, I witnessed, uh, well, let me give you a quick, quick background. Born in the northwest of England, so close to Liverpool. Um, moved from the northwest of England as a family, 1966, which I realize for a few here is a date that resonates, but for most of you is a piece of ancient history. But in 1966, we went to live in Jamaica. Uh, my father wanted to, to practice dental surgery. Um, he was born in Angola in, in West Africa of Indian parents from the middle of India. Uh, my mother was of a Panamanian father and a Ghanaian mother. I mean, we're a real mix, but located into Jamaica. And when we, I remember when we arrived in 1966, Jamaica was a kind of gloriously lovely, lush place. Everybody was in contentment. Uh, there was a, a spirit of what the motto of Jamaica is, which is out of many one people. And there really was a one peopleism about every community. And then a couple of years later, people made just a rotten political decision. And you see this all over the world when, in some ways, it was ironically the beginning of what, witnessing popularism, but it was 1970. And the people of Jamaica voted for a government that was aligned to Cuba, which of course was aligned to the USSR. And that was not a clever thing to do. And the, the older of us on the front bench remember there was a thing called the Cuban Missile Crisis in 1962. And the, the American, your country, but your government was not keen on this island of three million people lining up with Cuba, which was lining up with the USSR, and quite rightly put in some pressure points to change the situation. But the situation didn't change. People became very stubborn in their persistence. And, I, and I, as a child, I witnessed Jamaica going from this happy, lush, open, uh, tender environment, this, this oneness, to fractiousness, to violence, to people being discriminating, blacks against whites, violent of people in the streets. I saw, I saw people hit and cut by machetes visibly with my own eyes. And as a young child, I felt this place is going to shatter them. And people left in droves. And if they could leave, they left. And uh, my father's brother left and moved up to Canada. Uh, my father said, no, we're going to stay. We're going to see it through. But our parents got very distressed that my brother and I would be too much caught in the turmoil. Eventually, they moved us out back to England to go to boarding school. But here's the story you're referring to, because the shops had emptied. And you would go to what was once a supermarket, but there's very little there other than domestic product. I mean, even things as a child, we would have had cornflakes that came from the US. And we couldn't get cornflakes. And this is a sugar-producing country, and we couldn't get sugar. And we couldn't get the basic things that you would think you need in a cupboard to make breakfast work, let alone lunch, let alone dinner. We couldn't get them. And 
some of our relatives' family in Canada sent this box, this huge box, which arrived through the post. And my mother was expecting it to come. She'd had a letter saying it was coming. Remember, this was the days when there was no such thing as social media or computers. So, you know, somebody sent a letter, it arrived, you opened it up, oh, it alerted you. You know, there was a box and the box arrived. And in the box were, I, my, my recollection, there were three things in the box. There was soap, there were onions, and there were apples. It's an odd combination. I don't know how you make lunch out of that, but, but uh, <laughs> never mind. At least you could clean up afterwards. But what, we, what my mother did was she took, there probably was a ring of about 30 of each of these. They're just going around in a concentric circle like this. And she took it all, and she, I stood with her in the kitchen. And I must have been probably 10, 11, uh, something like that. And I, and I watched her take a, an apple and an onion and a soap and put it there, and apple, onion, and put it there, and apple, and put it there, and put it there. So, and before we knew her, the whole kitchen was covered in, in an apple, an onion, and a soap. And I said, what are you doing? And she said, well, this one is for Jemima, and this one is going to be for Wendy, and this one is going to be for Christine. And, this one. and I said, why, why are you giving all this away? And she said, we only need one apple one onion and one bar of soap. So why don't we give the rest away? And it hit me at that moment. Why don't I give things away? So I started giving things away. Because that's what I saw my mother do. And I realized then that actually, when you don't have things, is the best time to give them away. Incredible. It's, uh, it's not a surprise that as it relates to gener generosity, the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. <laughs> we yes, experienced your yeah. generosity and your giving nature. I, I imagine that was a formative experience in helping you to find your purpose in life. You came yes. to purpose early in, in life. Tell us a little bit about that, that process and how that's unfolded mm. for you. So, uh, 1972, um, our parents sent my brother and I to boarding school in the north of England. It was a school called Scarisbrick Hall. Uh, it still exists today. I, I was there just two years ago, opening the new library. Um, uh, I've taken my parliamentary title from Scarisbrick. Um, I'll, I'll explain how that works another time. But, but uh, at the age of 16, so my, I arrived, we are, my, my brother was 16, I was 14 when we went to the school. Um, the very first experience the very first experience we had was going to a, uh, a Christian fellowship meeting. And at that meeting, the head of English, a wonderful man who led this Christian fellowship group, uh, saying to all, it was only the boys in there. It was a mixed school, but I remember it was just boys in, at this particular time. And I remember him saying, he had a very sharp voice. And he said, boy, 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 you need to know that the devil lives in the duvet. In other words, if, if the bed conquers you on a daily basis and you cannot shift the covers because you can't get up to make the day count, you'll never make anything matter. And I learned very early on that there was, this place was going to be a place of purpose. And so within a short space of time, at the age of 16, my friend uh, Michael Sargent, we were out walking around the grounds. We had a big lake. Uh, and he said to me, he said, what are you going to do with the rest of your life? Now, I, I don't know if you've ever been asked that question at 16, but I was asked that question at 16. And I asked him back, too, what are you going to do with the rest of your life? But he said to me, what are you going to do with the rest of your life? Uh, and I, it, just, it came out, because I'd witnessed what stark poverty looks like, and I'd witnessed how a culture can be corrupted from the top down so quickly and can go towards violence and disarray. And as, as anybody knows, if you look at the sto story of Jamaica and many other places, it's still struggling to come to terms with that decision. You know, things have moved. Uh, Kenny and I were there in April. Uh, we went to do some things uh, with the government in Kingston. But you see things have moved. But has it recovered the kind of sense of balance and equilibrium that it once had? No, it hasn't. But my friend said to me, what are you going to do with the rest of your life? And I, it, came, it just came out of me, just like sweat. I said, 
I want to speak for the poor, and I want to bend the power of the prosperous to the potential of the poor. And I didn't know what that meant. I really didn't know what that meant. I mean, speak for the poor sounds like, okay, I can speak for, about, with, but how does that, how does this thing work where you, you work with people who are prosperous to think about the poor in a way that they develop opportunity, freedom, prospect, learning, education, investment. How do you do that? And all sorts of ways have unfolded as the years have gone by. And we're going to come to a, a couple of those great opportunities yeah. you've had. Uh, in the interim, though, you chose to study theology. I did. Tell us yes. a little bit about what went into that decision well, and how, you, how, that, or how your faith has informed the decisions you've made since then. Yeah. So um, my parents were wonderful. They're obviously both elsewhere in, in the spirit world um, and now. Uh, but my, my father being a medical academic and my grandfather having been a medical academic and my uncle having been a surgeon and my aunt having been uh, a nurse, there was such a weight on being academic. Uh, and uh, it's not that I wasn't capable of that. I just wasn't the same as my brother. So my brother, um, you can Google him at some point, but don't, don't waste your energy now. But uh, my brother was, um, until recently, was dean of MIT. And, um, and is still at MIT. He retired and uh, then went to Singapore to, to head up the MIT Singapore Government Science and Technology Center, which is all about automated vehicle, vehicles and artificial intelligence and everything else. And then now he's back at MIT as um, he's, the, he's the head of the aerospace engineering division of MIT. He tried to leave it many times, and MIT just keeps on hauling him back. So he was going to take this clear academic, mathematical, scientific route in life. And my parents thought that was wonderful. And I remember telling mom and dad that I'd been at a, a mission event with Billy Graham. And Billy Graham had challenged me at 15 to make a commitment to study theology. And I responded to that challenge. And I thought, well, what, why? I want to go and study theology. Why not? I mean, after all, my father was an, an, an elder in the Presbyterian church. My mother was a, a deacon in the, in the Anglican church. So why wouldn't I? I mean, theology would be a great thing. Wouldn't they like that? No. <laughs> they didn't like that at all because because my brother was going to do the great thing, which is become an academic, a scientist. He was going to be first response to the brilliance of the name. And I was going to, according to my father, waste my future. So, um, you know, I'm sure they're listening from above. Um, and I wish them well today. And I hope they have clear skies where we are, as they are. And then <laughs> my, fa my father said, well, if you're going to take that route, you'll have to fund yourself. So they funded my brother through Oxford University, and they refused to fund me. Uh, and I had to plead with an English local authority called Lancashire County Council if they would help me go and study theology. And I went to the London School of Theology, and I did three years and did a degree in theology and uh, emerged having fulfilled the commitment I made at 15. And if anybody said to me, why are you studying theology? My answer would be because that's what I told God I wanted to do and I would do. So irrespective of whether my parents thought it was a great idea or not, and I could see my brother ascending uh, through the ranks of academic capability, I would do what I felt God wanted me to do. And that, that's what I did, and there we go. I mean, I think my life has been a carnage ever since. Uh, well, those, those choices and that deep sense of purpose to yeah. bend the will of the mighty to help the poor led you to KPMG, mm. yes. where you were the head of global citizenship. Yep. Tell us what that means and per perhaps an, an example of work that you were particularly proud of during that time. Yeah. Well, I, you know, I've seen, I've seen this expression of that mission. It's something, that, it's something that Boyd and I talk about quite a lot is uh, literally waiting for the moment when, when the best, most purposeful opportunities come along. Uh, rather than rushing to create everything yourself, wait for the kind of synergy that God creates and, and that you then step into that order. 
So you know, I, I, started, I, started working with, um, I started working with drug addicts way back in my early 20s. Um, and it was just something I was just led to spend time with people who were in very tough circumstances. And um, I'd, I mean, was, I, I sat with somebody once for three weeks who was coming off a heroin addiction. And to go, to go through the process of withdrawal is a very deep, messy, um, horrendously painful thing to witness, let alone for him to experience. But I, I just felt that God had said to me, be where the poor are, be where the, the needy are. And so that's where I would go. Um, and then when I ended up in KPMG, uh, uh, which is not full of very poor people, <laughs> It's that full of the opposite. But then I realized, actually, I'm amongst the prosperous. So if I'm amongst the prosperous, then here's this mission is going to come into existence to bend the power of the prosperous to the potential of the poor. And how do you challenge a, a big organization of, uh, as it's now 220,000 people in 160 countries in the world, how do you challenge them to think about the people on the other side of reality? Not their reality, but still reality. And of course, you have to get into the weeds of connecting um, ordinary people with ordinary people. I mean, at the end of the day, you strip away wealth, title, office. Who are you other than a woman, a man, who look each other in the eyes and say, how can we share humanity together? And, and if, you, if I have and you don't, or you have and I don't, what could we do that we could enable something to come together? And I remember. Way back, 2006, I just started at KPMG. Uh, I've just retired. In fact, this week at Enactus is my last act of service for KPMG, although I kind of thought it was my last act. I've, I've, they, I've got two more things I've got to do for KPMG this fall, but never mind. Uh, it, that, that, that's, that's a joy. But, um, and it genuinely is. So it's, one is for Enactus in Belgium, uh, and the other one is with uh, African leadership in, in Norway in October, but that's great. Uh, I'm very happy to, to do them, it's, it's important. Um, so so he, I remember 2006, the chairman of KPMG came and knocked on the door, a lovely man called Mike Rake, and he said, um, he said, I know you've only just started, you're just two weeks in, but I want you to come and present to the board next week. They're all gonna be in London, come and present to the board. And I said, I can't do that. I don't even understand this organization. I know it's all over the world. It's all about accountancy. It's about tax. It's about business services. You know, I've been in the BBC. I was head of public affairs. I was the government relations. I was the chief lobbyist for the BBC. And you're saying to me, come and tell us what to do? I haven't a clue. So he said, exactly. Just come and tell us what you want to do. I know. OK. So I stepped into this boardroom a week later. He said, no, no presentation slides. Just come and tell us what you want to do. So I literally had a small piece of paper, and on it were written three things. Number one, we need to take the climate seriously. We need to understand that we don't make cars, and we don't produce airplanes, and we don't have fossil-consuming factories, but we produce a ton of paper. We consume a huge amount of electricity and uh, air conditioning, and we produce carbon. And we better be serious about it because a crisis is coming. And I remember in 2006 saying to that board, a crisis is coming. And nobody was talking about it then. Well, a few were, but now you can't avoid the conversation. And I said, we're, we're, we're an audit firm, so we better learn to measure our impact on the planet, and we better reduce it. And that's what we have done consistently in my 13 years Cut it, cut it, cut it. As the business has grown and grown and grown and grown, we've cut our carbon. So that was number one. Number two was we must support the poor. Now here am I saying to the leaders of this business, which is focused on driving profit, we must support the poor. And they're all looking at me. They're staring at me. I don't think they don't get it. But I tell you, I'm going to find ways to show them what this means. And then the third thing was we'll create a leadership culture where everybody in this business knows how to give chunks of themselves away. So the chairman said to me, so what does that look like? So I said, OK, I'm going to bring you demonstration priorities. I'm going to come back to your next board meeting. I'm going to show you what the demonstration options are. So here's the good example. 
So then my great friend, uh, Jeffrey Sachs at Columbia University in New York. Some of you will know Jeffrey. Great, thoughtful architect of the Millennium Development Goals, pioneer of the Sustainable Development Goals, brilliant economist. Uh, Time Magazine said of Jeffrey Sachs, the single most influential economist in the world in 2008 during the global financial crisis. Fantastic mind, deeply moral man. And he said to me, he rang me up and he said, Michael, there's a community in Tanzania on a little island, Pember Island, north of Zanzibar. Zanzibar is a holiday destination. Rich people go and lie around in Zanzibar beaches. But there's a little island which is infested with disease. And there's a tiny community on the top right-hand corner. And there are 10,000 people there. And they're in destitution. And they're living a Stone Age existence. And they're in literally the, the, what you would never expect of a kind of n no facilitation no electricity, no technology, no jobs, no maternal care, no health, uh, no futures, and people are dying en masse, and it's disease-infected, and it, it's mud hut lat. Would you go and have a look? And if you go and have a look, maybe KPMG could do something about it. So I thought, oh, okay, I'll go and have a look. So I went and had a look, and <laughs> flew down to Dar es Salaam, and then got a little plane, one of those ones, and you get over to Chaki Chaki, and then you drive for three hours, and, eventually, and the roads go all over like this, and then you end up in this. Well, in fact, you smelt it before you got there. And when I say no sanitation, I mean no sanitation. So what do 10,000 people do multiple times of the day? They leave their mess out. And the smell was overwhelming. So overwhelming. And my youngest son, Carl, who was with me then, he said to me, Dad, why, why are there worms crawling between those, that boy's eyes? And I looked, and there were worms across this child's face. And then we looked, and there were worms up his arms. And, and the, every child was infested. And I realized what this was, and why nobody cared. And Jeffrey said to me, when you get back, you face a choice. You can tell nobody. You could press delete on your computer. Or you could do something. He said, I can't get a business to look at it. I can't, the, the government's not interested. What do you want to do? So I went to the KPMG board. And I remember the chairman saying to me, so Michael, what is this thing you want to tell us about in Tanzania? And I said, OK, I'm going to tell you what this thing is. I described it. I said, I think we could do this. And I, I said, it's going to cost maybe a couple of million, but I have no idea. And he said to me, I'm very clearly, the chairman said to me, so where is the business plan? And I, you know, I know there's business schools teach business plans. But this is what I said. There isn't one. So then there was that kind of, uh-huh, there's no business plan. So you're asking a, you know, an audit tax and business services organization to do something with no business plan. So I said, no, there's no business plan. So then he said, OK, so why should we do this? And I said, because we can. And he said, OK, go do it. And we spent nine years and $3 million. And we built a community of thrivingly economically free people. Built the toilets, put in the electricity, created a working environment, a seaweed farming industry, help people reconstruct properties, uh, redevelop the fishing industry, plant tens of thousands of trees. Uh, now you go to it, you see everybody's got a mobile phone. The school is recovered. Uh, kids are actually learning off Kindles. They're learning multiple books from Kindles. That they, they're reading, we got groups of girls. When we started, the girls attending school was less than 20%. Now it's nearly 90%. Um, Children were dying constantly, babies, because there was no maternal care. Nobody's died now in the last four years. And this was a labor of love. And I said, I'm going to do that. We're going to do this. And I will go every year. And I went every year for nine years. And we finished it last year. Wonderful example. Yeah. Absolutely uh, incredible. Uh, you, you love how you talked about you had a choice in that yeah. moment. Yeah, yeah. And, but your sense of purpose, yeah. your values, 
maybe your mom whispering in your ear. Yep, definitely uh, that. You know, pushed you back to do something incredible that, yeah. that uh, changed people's lives forever. Talk to us a little bit about being a member of the House of Lords. So for us uh, American folk who need a primer in uh, <laughs> UK government, what, what is the House of Lords and, and what do you do? Wow. Well, the House of Lords, um, it's, it's, if you've been watching Game of Thrones, it's not the same. Uh, <laughs> But you might have thought it's the same, but it's not the same. So the House of Lords is the Senate. Uh, you have a House of Representatives in Washington and a Senate. Um, so we have a House of Commons, meaning representing the common person, the ordinary person. And a House of Lords is the equivalent of the Senate. So, it's the, so your, your, your government is framed after the way our government was because it used to be a colony. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry to mention that, but, you know, I mean, after all, you are not speaking American, but speaking English. English. There you go. Ever wondered why? <laughs> so the House of Lords is the upper house of the two houses of parliament, unlike the Senate, uh, which is which are wonderful men and women elected to office for their period of time and then reelected and reelected, and, as you know, many of them there forever. But the House of Lords are all appointed so Her Majesty the Queen appoints us. Uh, we're appointed for life. Uh, we don't have to face election. Um, and we represent the constitutional responsibilities of the monarch. So the United Kingdom is a kingdom. There is a monarch, Her Majesty the Queen. Uh, there, there are princes and princesses and dukes and earls and viscounts and all the rest of it. Um, some of you might have watched the, the Netflix series, The Crown. Uh, if you've watched that, you kind of understand a little bit of the reality of what it's like. Um, it's not as bad as Netflix painted it, but never mind. Uh, it, it's colorful, put it that way. Um, because they're like, you know, they're ordinary, ordinary people. They have to blow their nose and do everything else. Uh, but the, the structure of government is the monarch, uh, parliament with its two chambers, and then a government which is the executive. Very similar. The difference is the House of Lords is not elected is a permanent appointment. It is the Queen's decision alone. And once appointed, the duties that fall on me and on every other member of parliament in the upper house is to uh, improve the best of legislation. So make law really good, work at law, challenge and question government, and prioritize things that are going to keep the United Kingdom stable and strong. Don't ask me about Brexit. <laughs> <laughs> But if you want, I'm happy to give you what's well, going to happen. <laughs> well, we'd be remiss if we didn't take advantage of the opportunity to hear uh, real time what's going on. So give us, we, we could talk about this all day, I imagine, but give us a, a brief primer on where we've been, where we are today, how you anticipate it unfolding in the near future. Well, this is video. I realize that. <laughs> so this is going to be an archive forever. <laughs> um, so he, well, here's the parallel to your governmental structure, uh, which is you have an appointed Supreme Court. And you also have every member of your president's cabinet is appointed. None of them are elected. So if you're saying, well, isn't it strange England has this weird thing of all these appointed people? Well, you do the same. It's exactly the same. It's just in different structures. Today, the Supreme Court in, in the United Kingdom is assessing, literally today, has been for the last few days, is assessing whether or not the Prime Minister was right to suggest that Parliament be suspended, it's this strange word called parode, be suspended so that the Queen can come on the 14th of October and present a new legislative plan. My own view is the Prime Minister was wrong, and the challenge in the Supreme Court is right. The Scottish courts have ruled that the Prime Minister was wrong, and we will see what happens probably tomorrow. So we are in a place of great turbulence at the moment. All I would say to that is, and this is an encouragement to you as uh, American citizens, is, and I'm going to just be very, if you don't mind me being controversial for a teeny second. If your 
Senate and House of Representatives had the same guts to challenge the president. As you are seeing in the United Kingdom, members of parliament and the upper house challenging the government and not allowing the government to ride roughshod over principle. These very important principles of the integrity and responsibility of those with office means that if you get the privilege to serve, you need to face that responsibility square on. So last week, in the last week that Parliament sat, I voted five times against the government on the Wednesday, a Thursday, and a Friday, five times to ensure that we had a, a law in place that stops the United Kingdom falling out of the European Union without the right processes in place to protect the poor. And when people say to me, oh, you're standing in the way of the people's vote, I'll say, if the people voted stupidly because they didn't understand that the impact of that decision could disempower tens of thousands of people from their work and their freedoms and their potential and their futures and destroy their economy, then I'll stand up for the poor. I'm not going to see them trashed by so-called democracy. And here's the biggest challenge of the democratic system. The Economist had a really detailed review of what happened in your presidential race a few years ago. Now, I have no idea where you sit on either side of the fence, but that's irrelevant. Because wherever you sit, the realities are the realities. Uh, but put it this way, the Economist newspaper assessed the Electoral College process. And they did it with, in tandem with the New York Times, the Washington Post, a couple, of, uh, a couple of USA Today, a couple of other journals. And what it showed is this. If everyone who could have voted had voted, according to their designations of previous votes, then, no, I'll just say it as it is. You don't have to like the outcome. But Hillary Clinton would have had 330 college votes and Donald Trump 202. So the issue is not popularism. The issue is political disengagement, not taking our duty as citizens seriously. And we know in the United Kingdom that if everybody who could have voted had voted, we wouldn't have this Brexit stuff. The figures would have been substantially reversed the other way around. And it challenges all of us to ask, as citizens, how much do we revere that responsibility? Do we take it seriously? Because it's a responsibility to somebody else. It's not just about how I feel. It's about what do I do that affects the poor, but affects the possibility that somebody else could thrive. But if I make the wrong decision, somebody else will suffer. I have to think about that. And in Parliament, we have been pushing back on the government. Originally, the UK was going to leave the European Union on the 31st of March, and then it was going to be in June, and now it's going to be in October, and maybe it's going to be further on, and maybe it's never going to happen. Maybe it will. Literally, in the last hour and a half, the President of the European Commission has said that he thinks that there is a deal arrangement that could work. Now, if that is the case, Parliament will vote for it because we will do dignity to the referendum. But if it's not the case, when we come back on the 14th of October, we will resist and fight and stop the government railroading the poor. We will not let it happen. So you haven't seen the end of the story. And I'm very happy to update you on November the 1st. <laughs> Stay tuned. Well, thank you for uh, uh, encouraging us and, and waxing a bit controversial. I think it's, it's well for us to remember the, the rights that we have and, yeah. and the obligation we have to exercise those rights. I have one more question for you, and then we're going to open yes. it up to a, a couple questions from the audience. Yes. Wish we had more time. Uh, Stephen Covey taught that we should live life in crescendo. Yes. That our greatest work is always ahead of us. What is that for you? <sighs> well, uh, I'm six, nearly 62. Um, I've said in public many times that uh, 
the, the Sustainable Development Goals, which go to 2030, the end of extreme poverty and hunger, that is a big objective for me. Uh, I'm Vice President of UNICEF in the United Kingdom. Uh, the various foundations that I sit on, the Vodafone Foundation, being involved with UNICEF, uh, an organization called Tier Fund, which is a development agency, uh, I'm President of the Zimbabwe Aid Agency, that if you look at all these different things I'm involved in, I get to give away roughly around $100 million a year of gifted resource that changes the lives of other people. And I, I want to do everything I can to accelerate achieving the end of extreme poverty and hunger. Uh, I, I've, sat, I've been in refugee camps in the Lebanon, in the north of Kenya, uh, in Liberia, I've been on UN flights around destitute places in the world, and I've seen how people struggle with even a cup of water. I've seen how, how much people can, can die for the absence of things that we are careless over. So I cannot, I cannot sit by and not want to drive every opportunity I can to move minds towards the poor and to help people understand that there are three levels of poverty. There's poverty of the being, there's poverty of the spirit, and poverty of the mind. And Mother Teresa said that the greatest poverty is the poverty of the spirit. Because, you see, people can have everything and, in effect, have nothing because they have the material but not the heart. That's poverty of the spirit. But you can also have nothing materially and you're destitute with frustration. And then you are uneducated. And if somebody's uneducated, particularly for young girls in structures in the world where it's easy to take advantage of girls, men taking advantage of girls because of their lack of ability to say no and to have a structure of discipline to their lives, early childhood marriages, the, the taking away of young girls' freedoms, so I've got to fight for that. And that will push me way into my 70s. So I'm on. I'm on. Game on. Um, you know, you've got to have vigor. As, as I said, General MacArthur said, it's, it, it, youth is in the mind. It's not in the body. You, the body will creak. But as long as the mind is full of determination and vision and is unwilling to stop, and I'm unwilling to stop until we see some of these great powerful objectives fulfilled, and the world is a better place for it. And, and we can hold the hands of those who've been broken and say, I'm glad you can stand up, because then you could hold me too. And it's that common vision together, that common desire together that I long for. Wonderful, inspiring. We're excited to see uh, what the future holds and hopefully you've inspired others to co-enlist uh, in uh, this and great come cause. on the journey. Come on the journey. Come on the journey. Let's give Lord Hastings a round of applause. Oh. And let's uh, open it up to questions. I think we have time for just a couple questions. Do you remember Mitch? He was one I that do. visited you. I do in, indeed. In your Lovely office to see you. in London. Um, what's your approach to learning, and how do you stay so informed about what's going on around the world? Like, what sources do you go to for that? Ah, uh, well, my approach to learning is it's a lifelong journey. Uh, we should never, ever, ever stop being curious. It's, it, 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 in this generation where, uh, you know, uh, in your phone you can access more data than, than my parents, my brother, or I ever had access to in the 1960s, 70s, or 80s, you can learn anything in the flash of a second, and you can find things out, then why not? When I was, um, when I was speaking to the students, uh, the 3,000 students on uh, Tuesday at the Enactus World Cup, I put up four pictures, well, actually five, but four pictures that were particularly challenging. And these were tardigrades. Do you know what a tardigrade is? Some of you will know what tardigrades are. Water bears. A tardigrade, a water bear, is a microscopic creature that lives all over you. There are millions in this room. You cannot see them. They're totally invisible to the naked eye. They have eight legs and somewhere around 24 little claws, and they're microscopic. 
And the Israelis were landing uh, a spacecraft on the moon in April. It crashed. They couldn't get it to land in the right spot. And it released millions of these tardigrades because they're testing the durability of these microscopic creatures that live. They're all in, this carpet is full of them. Your clothes, are, every time, you know, when, you know when you're somewhere and all, you feel that itch? It's eating you. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's going, <laughs> because what they do in the ecosystem that I believe God has created, in this ecosystem, the tardigrades consume dead flesh. They remove the dead bits of us. That's how we churn over. Now, I, I found out about these tardigrades about six months ago, and I've been studying them. I mean, why, you know, but I, get, I think it's so interesting. So if you can find out about bizarre things, why would you not want to be curious about it? Go have a look. See pictures, see images, see sculpture. Go look at museums. Understand the world. Be curious about how things move and don't move. What I do for news information, for information, I have, I think, four primary sources. So the BBC, which I'm very, very grateful for. Uh, I mean, I was just telling Boyd on the way here, it has some of it, flaws, which need fixing. We'll get there. But the BBC is a great source of international clarity. You know, I sat in a, a northern Nigerian village called Kano, which is an all-mud village. In fact, it's not a village. It's a city of 12 million people in the north of Nigeria, but the whole thing are mud buildings because it is arid dry. And three times a day, the BBC World Service broadcasts in Hausa, which is the language of the northern Nigerian people. It broadcasts to them news of their region from London. And I watched thousands of people stop at half past one in the afternoon and half past six in the evening. I wasn't there for the breakfast one because I flew in that morning, but I saw two in the day and they stop and they gather around shortwave radios and they listen to what's going on in their region and in Nigeria and in Africa and around the world. And I think if the, if the house of people in an entirely sand and mud city can care about what's happening in the Philippines, why don't we know? We better find out. My very dear friend, Neil, who lives in South Africa now, a very wealthy businessman, he began his care for orphans in Africa, having studied at Harvard. His care for orphans in Africa, because when he was in Harvard, he listened to the BBC World Service, and he discovered that there were over 46 million known orphans in sub-Saharan Africa in eight countries. And he thought, I've got to do something about that. But if he'd not gone to sources of intelligent knowledge, he would have just thought, eh, you know. Hmm. But when you discover things, you have to act on it. So the BBC, uh, The Economist, The Financial Times, and then I also, there's an Apple News thing, which is a really good compendium, as long as you put the right, don't put in celebrity news and trash, you know, all that kind of stuff, but put in about really important things. And so I, I go to all those sources every single day, a couple of times every single day, and I just keep myself alert all the time. Let's do one more. All right. So I know you're passionate about mentoring others, and I would like to be in a position to do so and am considering becoming a personal coach. What have you learned to help others realize and achieve their potential? That's such a well-framed question. <laughs> um, I, I always think of mentoring as a life journey, not a let's have a couple of meetings and then we're off. So um, two weekends ago, I went to celebrate my dear friend Anthony's 80th birthday. So he's 20 years older than me. When I was 18, he was 38. And he started to mentor me. I remember we met in South London. I, I'd gone to a meeting probably about 10, 15 people around a table. I was the youngest person there. I was 18. Plus, I was black. I mean, what's a black young man doing in a meeting in a very elegant part of London? But never mind. I, somebody asked me to go, and I went. And there was this guy on the other side of the table looking at me. And at the end of when this meeting ended, he came over, 
and we sat together and he said, should we go and have a cup of coffee? Let's go and find a cafe somewhere. And we did, and that was the beginning of a mentoring journey. And we became solid, close, totally valued friends. And two weekends ago, it was his 80th birthday and I was the speaker at his 80th birthday event. And the point is this, if you're gonna get involved with people, you're beginning a life journey. You don't know how long, you've no idea how long it's going to be, how long it's going to take. Uh, I had somebody send me a message literally last week um, who sent me a message saying, 30 years ago, you gave me half an hour to talk about how I could be useful to change a particular community of need. And I've since then done this, 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 this. And he said, I just wanted to tell you that that 30 minutes has produced 30 years of effective engagement. And I was so, I was thrilled by that because it means if you, if you invest uh, wisdom with people, they can produce it and reproduce it and reproduce it as long as they long to. But if you don't give time away, which means giving away your inner soul and being willing to walk in a relationship journey, I became, the, president of this wonderful organization committed to Zimbabwe because in 1988 I was on a flight from Greensboro, North Carolina to Washington, D.C. One hour flight, the guy sitting next to me wouldn't shut up. You know how irritating those people are? And you just, you've never met somebody and they're really boring and they're talking. And you think, I've got to keep turning my head because they won't stop talking. And eventually his talking, his name's Tom, and eventually his talking became rather funny. And I started engaging with him. And we engaged with each other so much that when we arrived at Washington, D.C., he said to me, what are you doing for the rest of the day? I said, well, I haven't got a plan. So he said, why don't we go and look around all the museums together? So we did. And here we are since 1988 to now, very close friends. He's the director of Zane, and I'm the president of Zane. We've done things together. You go on a journey with people, you do things together. And mentoring is about how do you share your soul? Not how do I give you a business engagement, pass over a card, walk away, and, and wish you good luck. And that, I think that's the big difference. If, now, then people say to me, but if you can't, you know, there's 7 billion people on the planet. How do you do that to 7 billion people on the planet? And the answer is you can't. But what you do is you find ways to share wisdom through mass platforms. But if you can, with the few, take the journey of helping shape them and they shape you and learn together, well, then you've created magic. Well, it's been a delight to visit with you for these short minutes. Thank They've you. flown. I wish we had uh, more time. But it's been absolutely remarkable and inspiring. Thank you for sharing Thank your life you. and uh, your experiences with us. Uh, Winston Churchill once characterized the relationship between the UK and the US as a special relationship. Yes, yes. We hope that this is just the beginning of a special relationship. Thank goodness, it is. It's still there. <laughs>